jeepers! You're listening to Smash or Pass! Hello everyone, welcome back to another interview on the JB and Millie channel. I am JB and of course I'm here with Millie. Hi! And joining us as the very special guest who will be interviewing today is Mr. Matt Wayne. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you so much. So you've done a lot of amazing work. And so kind of starting in terms of the timeline of your career, at least mm -hmm. according to IMDB side of things, we can clear up any discrepancies that possibly will arise from that later. But that credits yeah. your career as starting as a consulting producer and writer in 2000. But before that, what was the mm -hmm. kind of origins of your trip to get there? Well, I had been writing professionally since 89. Um, and in fact, I, I have a, a, a fond memory of my first freelance check. I was working at a, a video supply store with uh, my friend Jim Krieg at wow. the time. And I remember showing him a, a check that had Spider-Man's picture on it. And he was like, oh, my God, where did you get this? And he was very excited. It was it was nice that, you know, it was as impressive to him as it was to me. And but yeah, so I, I did comics for uh, 10 years. Yeah, well, I edited comics for five years. And I, I, I uh, before that, I wrote freelance um, very infrequently, Archie comics and stuff like that. I did a lot of Scooby Doo in the 90s, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, other uh, of the DC Comics uh, Cartoon Network uh, adaptation uh, comics. Well, I'm sure oh. that's sorry. Oh yeah, I was just going to say, and, and then uh, and then uh, you know it poured the stuff I had done ported very well into animation when I when people that I had worked with, uh, such as Jim Krieg and uh, and Dwayne McDuffie started to break in out here i i rode their coattails and, well it certainly you know. is interesting to hear that because all that is so insightful i don't think it you, you from this thing, looking at imdb and anything that was on there was it no i mean i did see some of the old scooby stuff and i kind of wanted yeah. to ask some questions about that but i didn't get to because oh gosh i think they were made mostly released in the us until i couldn't source any in time but they look really interesting and it's just nice to hear about jim krieg as well because when you mentioned his reaction to that spider-man comic i was hearing it in his voice exactly how he would say it as well so that's just oh my god yeah <laughs> well he was amazing i uh um i must have seen uh you know about his fan film viva spider-man i i take it i think i think we, he mentioned it briefly yeah. when we interviewed him and all of that. uh when I met him, he was a student at Tisch, and I worked in the dubbing room where we worked, and so I must have copied that thing fifty times, and uh, you know, I I know it almost by heart. Um, it it he was an amazing guy even then. One thing I neglected to mention is also my best friend when I was growing up was Richard Purcell, who is, was John Chris Valusi's right hand during the Ren and Stimpy run. Um, he got me in, involved in my first animation, which was Puccini's Yard, which, or Puccini, I don't know which, which it finally uh, was, uh, was marketed as, which came out, most places never saw it. It's, it's, uh, it's on IMDb mm -hmm. and, and YouTube. They're, they're just uh, seven minute gag cartoons and very, very fun. Mm -hmm. So I really, you know, I came into animation as kind of a polymath just doing uh you know scooby stuff and actual superhero stuff and comedy so and that has really helped because sometimes uh the work dries up in in one genre or the other i mean certainly yeah. it's really interesting to hear the origins there because like you say it's it's so beneficial to have worked on so many things because ultimately a lot of them will tie together really well and i know you were saying kind of things initially started with writing is there any kind of writers or shows or anything that you were familiar with kind of growing up that you kind of well you know this is the reason that i want to go into writing or things like that um it would take too long to list everything i was enthusiastic <laughs> about before i actually started writing myself but uh definitely um i was a huge fan of old doctor who i was a huge fan oh. of um uh the the more uh every sitcom i was i was addicted to those um well in the 70s there was a lot of 
junk, but um, let, let's let's say, you know, Cheers and, and the Ilk. I I was kind of really into that. I really, you know, I love sharp writing, and it's really unpopular to say so now, but I'm ancient and don't care. Uh, Woody Allen, I thought was brilliant, mm -hmm. and you know, um, a master of uh, the comedic phrase. Um, but yeah, a lot, of, and uh, you know, I read a lot of uh, uh, Stan Lee Marvel comics, which I really loved. The the kind of um, I I don't know if you want to call it corny or hokey or just like you know, uh, um, self consciously dramatic, <laughs> you know, and I I think that's 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 helped me quite a bit in in my career. And, you know, my own uh, contribution, I thought I was going to be writing romantic comedies um, when I was in college, and I wrote one, wasn't great, uh, I, you know, I made it, that wasn't great, and, you know, and I realized that I didn't know anything about romance, so <laughs> I was in college still, um, so it's... Uh, where where you end up and what you think you're going to be doing always uh you know it, it it's, it's always very fascinating to me um but i love almost everything i've ever worked on so it, it's fun yeah it's interesting that you mentioned the whole stan lee side of things and also the romantic comedy because i think depending on how you phrase a lot of their stories you could almost view Spider-Man as a bit of a romantic tragedy in some oh, ways. Like it so totally is. Yeah, like we're all like, oh, I don't want to get into it because it's he doesn't have much luck. I mean he does initially, but then it all kind of goes awry, much like how it is. And I guess on that you've got credits working on Spectacular Spider-Man. So what was that like and how did that come about? That was um I don't remember if uh, Mike, I I know that I spoke to Michael Vogel and Grace Ben when they were putting together spec Spectacular Spider Man. I don't know if they recommended me to Greg Weissman or if uh, I sent a sample to Greg Weissman. I don't actually remember, but um, it was a a wonderful experience. It was my first uh, time working with Greg. He's amazing. Um, what I love about him is the plot is all worked out before any freelance writers come in any staff writers it's you know greg is the uh you know he wants to be the hub of it and so that's actually very freeing so you can then it's just a matter of how how do i sell this uh so so well that the that when greg sees that he's gonna go oh cool you know <laughs> and that that's the challenge which i occasionally met um it's a i think it's a wonderful show i do think um that there have been many iterations of spider-man and it's it's one of the good ones you know there there are plenty of others um and i i think uh i really enjoyed oh god i'm blanking on his name uh the guy who played spidey <laughs> oh um josh keaton josh keaton is amazing he yeah. is I am so sorry. Uh, I, 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 uh, it's been a, it's late in the afternoon. I, I might be sundowning. We'll see. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so Josh Keaton's amazing. I remember he had a car and his, uh, license plate. He had a vanity license plate made up just when he was on the show and it said thwip. Oh, so, you know, occasionally you'd see him around town and say, Oh, look, there he is. Um, That's awesome. yeah, no, I thought that was really cool. I mean, I don't believe Len Wein had one that went snicked, but who knows? Um, so, yeah, uh, I was also going to say uh, Drake Bell's also good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just uh, there, there, have been, there have been, you know, it's a it's a very like uh, well done character in many media, and you know. I am uh, old enough. We well, we'll get to this when we're talking about Scooby. But I am old enough to remember the '67 show, either in the first run or just after that, um, and uh, that was entertaining too. 
um it, it became campier the older you got but <laughs> it it you know i do like spider-man yeah and i mean that's just one of the many kind of much loved characters that you've worked with like you said the spider-man we're going to come on to talk about scooby how does your approach kind of differ when you're writing you know say if you've got one of those really well pre-established characters compared to something that's an entirely new concept um you know uh sometimes the new concepts are easier but sometimes you you've got to make the decisions yourself for them i really um you know i know this is jumping around but on ben 10 um i came up with the character arjit and i came up with uh like magister patel day and it's really fun just to say okay uh, this Argic character is like Stuart Margolin in, in an episode of the Rockford Files. And I don't know if you guys have any idea what that what I'm talking about there. <laughs> um, just a friend of the heroes from from his past that kind of ropes him into skeevy uh, activities and get gets the hero into trouble. And it was really fun to, to uh, come up with that character. It was really fun to write him uh and at the same time i also very much enjoyed writing gwen who had, was well established by then you know it's uh um it's imp I, it's they're different muscles you know that's the only way i can put it and and it's fun to use them both the the creating the uh, original characters and the and the um the other <laughs> no i love that because argent really was such an essential character i think because it was more like kevin levin's reintroduction being a hero from villain yeah. and so it's kind of good to have that conflict in there like yes he's a hero now but we want to see that struggle like is he going to be tempted back into yeah. that kind of life or not so it was really essential to have him there i guess i should say uh you know a lot of that came in the room from Dwayne McDuffie. Um, you know, he saw Kevin's uh, uh, function in, in the news series. And I know that he wanted to have, uh, so I guess I can't say I said it was Stuart Margolin because I'm pretty sure that that was the shorthand that he and I used between us. Um, we'd worked together many times at that point. Um, so yeah, it's, it's still, uh, the point still stands. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And uh, Ben 10 is such an iconic character, such an iconic franchise. I remember being addicted to it when I was younger and probably beyond when I was a bit too old for stuff. But it was kind of thing that aged with the audience in many ways of all the iterations. So you've got credits for stuff like, you know, Alien Force, Ultimate Alien, Omniverse. So are there any episodes that you wrote or just viewed that kind of stand out to you as being particularly memorable? um mystery incorporeal which we're going to get to apparently um definitely that was fun that was my pitch to matt youngberg and i a lot of times we would uh the 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 story engine was myself charlotte fullerton uh matt youngberg and derek wyatt who's no longer with us um and a lot of times it was just basically we would go into a room and at the end of the day, we'd say, we have to do this again tomorrow because we didn't have anything yet. And sometimes, you know, the writers actually came up with ideas. <laughs> and because, um, you know, Derek Wyatt, uh, he he uh, had so much good stuff that went all over that show. Um, he was he was really something else. I wish he would have gone on to do more uh more writing too because he he really had a had a a good ear and a good story sense um but we were talking about i'm sorry i, I seem to have gotten ju just uh uh omniverse and how the stories were generated or just well, oh my favorites okay mm -hmm. um ben 23 i really enjoyed that was a lot of fun just having this alternate dimension that was very closely uh like our world but just a little different um something that i did that ended up getting cut uh, i believe for time um was uh, uh i had uh 
in Dimension 23, Kevin Levin's last name was pronounced Levine. Just because it's that that's something that uh you know it's a little change uh so it's uh that that one was 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 very fun for me um i loved hoax star the character um who actually len ween named um he's uh so i'm the whole experience of omniverse I mean, it came after Dwayne passed away. So the first six months of it are kind of a blur. But once uh, we realized that, yeah, we, we are making this show, um, it and, uh, you know, we are going to make it different enough from uh, Ultimate Alien that we don't feel like we're going over ground that was already better better done with with uh Dwayne and glenn murakami i i think it was a really fun show i really um i enjoyed all the people involved with it i enjoyed the uh the uh, the stuff that came out of it i thought the designs were very very fun and exciting and fresh and consciously distancing itself from Alien Force Ultimate Alien, uh, the one in the middle. Um, God, Ben 10 Alien Force, Ben 10. Was, were there only two? I thought there was a third one. No. Um, there was that initial just Ben 10 series, then it went to Alien oh, Force, yeah. Ultimate Alien, then Omniverse. Yeah. The The initial one was also very good. I'm, I'm, I'm a good friend of Tom Pugsley who did the story for that. Um, he was the story editor. Uh, so yeah, Ben 10 was great. Um, stuff that I'm really proud of. There's just all of my Justice League scripts, I think were great. That had a lot to do with the process. You know, if you sit in a room with Dwayne McDuffie, Bruce Tim, and James Tucker, and just write down everything everyone says, you're going to end up with a good cartoon coming out of that. <laughs> And my, my contributions are there. Uh, there are a lot of times uh, uh, where Dwayne would uh, would come up with a line and I might top it. And sometimes I didn't and we go back to the other. So it was it was um, a very strange career experience to that was my first full time story editing gig. Um, and it was very strange to like come into that at the very highest level i mean of daytime i suppose but honestly it was the best show it was better than i mean i don't think samurai jack was really in production that it was kind of bits of it but it was it, it felt like the, really the best animation on tv when we were doing it um, There's definitely so many iconic things on it. It's just interesting to hear you talk about that whole process of being a story editor. And of course, you've like been introduced as a story editor, but for something like Omniverse, where you've worked in the writing department and all of that, when it comes to transitioning into being a story editor from that stage, how does that work? You know, how was that approach? Um, I learned very quickly on on, uh, on Justice League. Um, I would not get my hands dirty. I would, the freelancer would, would turn in the script and I would say, here's the script. I think it's pretty good. And they'd say, why didn't you fix this and this and this and this and this and for the rest of the day. Um, and then I realized that it really is up to the story editor to make sure that the peg fits the hole. And I'm very comfortable now, uh, even with some of my most respected uh, writers, um, it comes in and I read through it once and then I just start chopping and hacking and revising because it, you know, the story editor is the one who knows the, the show uh, format, the show, what, what happened last episode, what's happening next episode, uh, what this character is, is like in this situation. And freelancers are usually able to approximate it, but you still need to have someone go in. Um, 
I've gotten to the point though where I can it takes me two weeks to write a script, but it takes me a day to rewrite a script, you know. So it's it's uh story editing is uh I think something I'm 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 good at. It it doesn't have all of the glory and all of the fun of being the one who wrote it, but I've got my name on a lot of stuff where the story editor plussed it. So I'm you know, what goes around comes around. Absolutely. And there's also been instances where you've been credited as the story editor and you've also written a few episodes within that whole genre as well, including, as we mentioned, the Ben 10 Omniverse episode, Mystery Incorporeal. So uh, yeah. you mentioned that you did pitch that, but where was the idea to fully make that a whole Scooby reference plot and the title? Where did that come about? It wasn't necessarily Scooby. It was... um and I know that's surprising to hear, but you know, that, that, it, that happened, but there was also a lot of Lovecraft in there, like the Miskatonic madness. Uh, uh, I don't know. What was it? A smoothie? I don't remember. Um, but uh, that one, uh, my pitch was, you know, we know that Gwen's going to a college somewhere in the East what's the worst possible thing that could happen to going to a college in the Eastern U S and that would be that it's this kind of, uh, Stephen King atmospheric horror thing or, or so there was Lovecraft Scooby. Uh, we, we just, uh, as we were talking in the room, um, and I think that was probably a, I don't remember if that was a half day or a full day there, they were usually either four or eight hours that we would book to all sit there and talk together um i think that one was uh was uh, uh four hours but it was loads and loads of scooby gags just fun kept finding their way into it and you know i think what prompted it was uh you know just saying well should zed be there if kevin's there and then you know and uh zed i'm I'm assuming you know, and maybe I shouldn't. Zed is the alien dog that was uh, that was uh, Kevin's sidekick in the later. Okay, you knew that. Um, so yeah, and once that happened, and having the unmasking uh, actually, you know, go terribly awry was uh, my contribution. I thought it was really funny. Um, I still crack myself, and you know, I've had people friends that have alopecia and it's like athlete's foot it's actually kind of sad when it happens to somebody but as something to reference and as something to blurt out as a joke it's pretty funny and just having her you know grab for her wig and say yeah my alopecia um it it makes me laugh um and it makes me have even more sympathy for chris rock but oh, I, cool. I, uh, there, there's a topical reference. I, you know, I, I hope this is out in time. <laughs> um, so <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, that, and the, the, the hall of doors, you just oh, have yeah. to do it, you know, but that was, um, by the time we, we got to that, I think we might've been already thinking about, the Johnny Bravo Scooby parody and what they did and what, what we could do that was like that. Cause that was pretty awesome. Um, that also is probably before you guys were born. Oh my God. Um, oh, no. you know who Johnny Bravo is. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's interesting. We've done a few, in fact, we recently did an interview with one of the storyboard artists that worked on that crossover. So it's, it's really mm -hmm. interesting how they kind of had that tie in. And it's just, it, it does surprise me when you said that, there wasn't Scooby in the forefront of the start of that story because, like you say, it's just packed with so many references. The hallway scene, and I think it's actually Kevin that starts off the whole thing by saying, "Looks like we've got a mystery on our hands," which is <laughs> so interesting. Uh, oh gosh, um, I I'm because of the process with that one. I'm pretty sure that was my line. I had no idea that I had done that, but of course I would. You know, because by then we were like, this is everything. Um, this, uh, the What surprised me is the Lovecraft stuff. Uh, Yuri Lowenthal is a huge Lovecraft fan, and I didn't know that. 
and he came to me afterwards and said wow are you really into lovecraft like and i was like no i i used wikipedia um, <laughs> i i uh n i read a lot of poe maybe as a kid but i i don't think i ever read any uh, any lovecraft do you recognize or it. oh sorry oh no go ahead Oh, sorry. I was just going to ask. Um, do you recall any Scooby Doo references, or maybe even any Stephen King Lovecraft references that were intended for the episode that perhaps didn't make it for time or past the concept stage? Um, I'm sure if I went and looked at my old drafts of it, I would find stuff. <laughs> but I, honestly, nothing stuck out. I don't think anything was cut or rejected that I, I was sad not to see you know no i mean i was kind of there in like in hindsight because i guess you really think about at least when i was watching this as a kid the superficial aspects when i'd seen all the scooby references i was kind of hoping to hear a jeepers out of gwen or something of that magnitude but of course probably would have been too on the on the hair well you know um you know the the stuff the bag we were we were pulling stuff out of was to service our story because i mean mm. charmcaster is doing something that i remember as being very serious but i'd be hard pressed to say exactly what her idea was um i think did we reveal just at the very end that it was her yeah because she was in like the police car when um at the yeah. very end she revealed us all yeah i mean it was something where i was more interested in showing you know our the alien force ultimate alien um four characters had been so well established and um i was sorry to see them go at the beginning of omniverse and you know uh i think i consciously waited a little while before i pitched hey we should find out what's up with them um so um i've already forgotten your question can we can, can we can you give it to me one more time uh it was just at uh, that point about any type of um references but i think we kind of covered all of that yeah. stuff you know i think just bouncing off what yeah. you said it's kind of curious to go back to my whole point in time watching that because instantly i will admit when i first sat down to watch omniverse i've become so yeah. attached to that dynamic kind of vibe between yeah. ben kevin gwen that when they instantly left in episode one it kind of broke my heart a bit but i think when they were introduced it was at the perfect time because at that point you'd be introduced to rook as well who you were quite attached to so it was great to see yeah. that dynamic it was fantastic yeah no i i think what we ended up with was 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 very good and but yeah just checking in with them i think i was more interested in just seeing where the characters were all the stuff about you know ben you know uh uh um wanting deciding maybe i should go here and getting an honorary doc doctorate just so gwen could face palm that kind of stuff but there was a very real connection to uh mystery Incorp to mystery incorporated which is derek wyatt you know he designs the that show um and i think uh he is probably where a lot of the scooby stuff came from mm -hmm. although you know if you say come up with four four beats that are references to scooby-doo i could do it you know yeah it's uh but yeah it's so i mean yeah i i it, my my sense of it was that it it should be just this really you know creepy place and of course once a place is creepy it makes sense that you get the scooby gang involved um so yeah 100 percent. it was all it all worked out perfectly almost lightning in a bottle in a way and just going through my memories of ben 10 i would think about the crossover it did with generator rex and given how well the scooby stuff fit into the episode i mean was there ever any i guess they couldn't really have any real talks about an in canon crossover but how would you see a scooby-doo and ben 10 crossover kind of playing out um 
it would be very difficult because to me, and this is, you know, 13 ghosts notwithstanding, um, the the core of Scooby-Doo is monsters aren't real. And the core of Ben 10 is, is aliens are monsters. So, I mean, I, I, I don't think that puts them totally at odds with each other. But um, I think we'd have to come up with something that would bridge that. So, you know, it might have to, you know, in, involve uh, some alien thing that sucks up Mystery Incorporated along with it. And they team up with, uh, with uh, Ben and Rook and some plumbers, you know, I, you know, anything more than that, I'd have to get paid, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, whether that just, just like taking notes, though. Yeah. It's interesting with Mystery Incorporated. I think they actually made Scooby canonic, like canonically, part alien in that show as well. So, oh, that's wild. I'm interested. I I didn't see them all. It was a good show. Um, that's funny. And you know, that's all. That's always been. You know, even as a kid, I would be like, you know, Astro on the Jetsons. That's more realistic. It took, mm -hmm. A dog couldn't really talk that much, you know, um, which I, I had to get over when I was writing Scooby. <laughs> um, but I am of the generation that saw Scooby do Where Are You in the first run. Mm. Um, and I'm still here to tell the tale. And also... I watched it that whole time, and I found out later that uh, the network took the, those first three seasons and ran them for the next three years as well. So there were six years of, of those three seasons because um, they were counting on the audience turning over um, as, as they aged out of it. I remember watching it that whole time and, and not realizing it. So that says something about me. No, I mean, I think they kept the art styles quite, like, consistent for a load of the iterations. I think dipping in and out of some of the later shows, it's almost indistinguishable if you're just catching a few frames or a few moments, so it's quite understandable. And also, really interesting to hear about your background with the Scooby franchise, because I guess, speaking for myself, and I believe Millie as well, but obviously you can chime in when you need to... Um, about Scooby-Doo was watching What's New Scooby-Doo. Every day we came back from school, What's New Scooby-Doo was on, and I just absolutely loved the show so much. And you're credited with an episode, um, Ready to Scare, which, again, is absolutely iconic. But prior to your work working on that, did you refer back to those original shows at all, or did you write kind of from memory? Um, I don't think, you know, that would have been like, two or three years before everything in the world was available if you just looked for it. I don't think I went back and looked at the original uh, run for that. I have since just because, you know, it's been on TV and I like it. Um, but for that particular Ready to Scare, I don't think I had. Um, I did remember the gargoyle from the original run um, that was just a guy in a suit. He, you know, he, he wasn't like on a building, but that was pretty much, uh, I pitched like six things to Ed Sharlick, who was one of the two co-story editors, him and George Doty. Um, and he, he, uh, liked the other stuff, but this one, he, uh, had been to Paris many times and thought it was really fun to have, you know, a gargoyle monster that was connected to Notre Dame. It certainly was a fantastic concept. And like JB was saying, I mean, What's New was certainly the kind of TV show that we were wanting to be late to school so we could finish the episodes yeah. in the morning and we're, we're rushing home to, you know, get back to viewing as well. So, um, you know, I certainly, certainly think it's an iteration that stayed with us the most. And I guess kind of we do like to ask because obviously you're closer with Scooby than us really and that we've just watched it. You've been there writing as well from either watching it growing up or working on it late, like, like, you know, working on it a bit later on. Was there ever a character that, you know, stood out to you as your favorite? Well, um. I feel like Shaggy and Scooby are the stars 
I mean, it's, uh, they're a comedy team and the rest of them is, it's an ensemble, but I feel like Fred and Velma and Daphne are kind of there to service the Shaggy and Scooby stuff to a great degree. Um, having said that, uh, I really enjoyed writing Velma just because she was a little too smart for what they were up to. You know, I always, I always, I always like that character that, you know, can be a little dry about what's going on, who can expect it and say, ah, I thought so better run, you know, that, that sort of thing. I, I think, um, that's a really fun character and, um, oh God, I can't think of her name. Um, the, uh, the what's new Scooby-Doo cast I thought was brilliant because they, they had you know they had uh casey and you can't do better it was a real thrill to go to the record for that and not only because i met colette sunderman who's awesome but uh uh the voice director but casey Kasem, it was a revelation to me uh how hard he was acting you know i it never occurred to me that he would be doing all the facial expressions. He would be doing movements and stuff to make sure it sounded right. He was uh, he was a consummate professional. He was pushing eighty by then. I don't know, um, but he was he was fantastic. He he was a joy to just watch him say stuff he wrote. Uh, Frank Welker was uh, brilliant i think there's a couple ad libs in there that i'm going to take of his that i'm going to take credit for because they ended up being really funny lines um he uh he he was he was brilliant you know uh and it's driving me crazy uh do you guys know she was natalie on uh facts of life <laughs> who played velma oh velma uh mindy co Mindy, yeah, she was awesome. I think she might be uh, my favorite Velma voice. I think yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> just perfect. And, you know, Great Delisle is always pitch perfect. You know, it was it was a really, really good cast. And it was uh, that w I was still new enough to animation that that was probably the sixth or seventh voice record I'd been to. And it was just etched in my mind, uh, all, all the uh, the amazing uh, things that I got to see just because I, I wrote it. And occasionally they turn to me and say, what did that line mean? And, uh, uh, it means they're scared, you know, <laughs> that sort of thing. It's that That's all I was there for, but it, it was really fun. It certainly sounds like, and I think like you said, kind of something that is really prominent about that area is the voice cast. It certainly you know kind of moving forwards when there's been changes and adaptations and new people brought in it's certainly yeah. I think the era that we personally kind of compare and contrast to a little bit just yeah. because it is I think because of when we were growing up and what was on the air at the time it is to us kind of the most core version of Scooby-Doo I think it's fair to say and I guess kind of something else yeah. that we really like about what's new is kind of been at that young age and one of the kind of key features of that and it's really prominent and in your episode as well is the, been able to globe trot a little bit go to places that you've never actually been to and obviously been able to you know go to Paris through the episode that you were and everything yeah. was that kind of part of because it is a common theme throughout the series was that kind of part of the pitches that you had to give that it was kind of about going to different countries and things like that or different countries different settings i think uh you know not, most animated shows want to have uh, a set of core uh backgrounds just because it's cheaper to produce this one didn't um one of the pitches that i had that i liked but we didn't get to was at an air circus somewhere in the midwest you know it's it there were there were plenty but it was new places all the time and i think that's really important um i think uh that show is probably the closest to scooby-doo where are you as far as i'm concerned because there was a very solid formula um they you know they would never on on uh on uh what's new they they would never have uh implied that 
that Scooby was part alien, um, mm -hmm. which is intriguing to me. But, you know, I also feel like uh, part of the key to to the Scooby-Doo franchise is that the scary things are never really as scary as they seem. Um, I think it's real easy after 35 years to want to get some variety in there. So I, I get it. Um, but what's new, I thought was a really, really well done show. Uh, I was glad to have been part of it. Um, Jim Krieg kind of hooked me up for that. He had been on the show um and this season that after he had been on uh was was ed and, and george and he had recommended me and it was uh really uh kind of an early highlight yeah i yeah. agree with it being like what's new scooby-doo oh like being scooby-doo where are you it was definitely the closest to that because a lot of times with scooby fans there's a lot yeah. of purists that almost use the original series as a guideline like you can do nothing that differs from that series and of course you appreciate that because it's definitely the one that made it but i think there's also almost neo purists that grew up on watching scooby-doo that it is so familiar in terms of it does all the formula stuff right but it expands on it with new stories new settings and so i think what's new scooby-doo definitely is almost like the Scooby-Doo, where are you, to a different generation. So I think that that's absolutely fantastic. And I guess expanding upon what you were saying before, that you had several other pictures that didn't make it, you know, because of time or, or anything. But do you have any memories about some of those pictures, apart from, like, the Air Circus and all of that stuff? Air Circus, uh, Scooby Springboards, Doc. I told you. Okay, Air Scare. That's the uh the air uh that was uh yeah that I think that has Daphne on a wing as a wing walker. I'm trying to remember. Yeah, Velma and oh both of them. Okay. Um lending a hand. Uh this is uh a, one in the Romanian opera house in Bucharest. Oh. Mm -hmm. It seems a little too much like the Paris one, doesn't it? Oh, I, I took one of the names. I took a name from that. Uh, Jenica is is uh, is in the ready to scare. But yeah, this this was a, a crawling hand, lending a hand in in the Romanian op opera house in Bucharest, and apparently there were only three. I thought there were six. That's Ooh. life, unless there's a longer one. No, I had three. But um. I was uh I I was uh really happy with Ready to Scare. Um Yeah. Yeah, Ready to Scare is such a cool episode. And like my favorite character of Scooby Doo is Daphne and so to expand on her family tree a bit there was absolutely incredible to see as well. Yeah. Well, and that that was done quite a bit in uh, in Mystery Incorporated too, um, mm -hmm. and possibly in contradiction with what went before. I'm not sure. A lot of times, it's different staffs have different ideas. Um, but yeah, like she had a she had a, Jenica ended up being her cousin, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. That's um, well that she was a pop star in in the the Crawling Hand episode that they didn't buy. That's fine. Um, Ooh, that would have been interesting to see. I almost want to drop an email to Ed Charlotte now and say, please, let's, <laughs> let's try and get the ball rolling on a revival. That sounds Yeah, that just sounds for amazing. that <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like a return yeah. special. But, I mean, on that, in terms of revivals... Folks, I, mean, I take it you folks have inter interviewed him? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. A while ago now, but that was absolutely amazing yeah. to hear about that side of things as well. Yeah, he's, he's an amazing guy. I haven't seen him in years. No. Oh. Anyway. No, I mean, it's the 20th, well, we just celebrated the 20th anniversary of What's New Scooby-Doo, which is incredible to think, but I mean, what's yeah. it feel like to be part of a show that's still loved after all that time? It's kind of lasted the test of time. Well, you know, my first major work was uh, editing comics for Milestone Media and Static Shock and stuff like that. Um, it's 
Scooby is one of several things that I've worked on that 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 have that. Um, it's it's kind of humbling. It's uh, I think if I could go back in time and tell my younger self, you're going to contribute to all this stuff that you love so much that you watch. Uh, I mean, uh, I mentioned Rich Purcell, who worked with John Christopher Lucy. We would get together every Saturday around 11 after the good shows were over, and we'd, we'd start our debrief and just <laughs> talk about what we'd seen. Uh, it was those stories were really like uh as real to me as anything going on in life i i feel very lucky to to have gotten to contribute to to scooby in some small way you know i mean we're so grateful that you have because like all of your career like you say there's so many things that have just lasted like spectacular spider-man a lot of people that is their definitive version of spider-man and what's new scooby-doo for a lot of people that is people's definitive version of scooby-doo and so it's absolutely incredible and i think beyond that uh your most recent iteration of scooby-doo or interaction with scooby-doo was with that wwe crossover which was really interesting to see so when we did speak to ernie altbacker who would eventually do the teleplay he mentioned that before that you wrote the outline and all of that stuff so how did that come about well um i uh the wwe um was talking to warner about doing another one of these they'd done the first one and um they were according to alan burnett who was the uh producer uh you know the the one guy who basically hired the writers um they were being very very difficult to get a uh, uh an idea for a feature where they felt that the wwe stars would would uh be able to 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 shine and what it, i pitched something called i believe scooby-doo and the monster moto which was basically the idea of the the, the cross-country uh race yeah. but i think it might have been in monster trucks and i think we kind of got a little away from that in the finished i've seen the 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 actual uh finished dvd and i liked it very much but i my memories are much stronger of the stuff i turned in <laughs> um we came up with an outline that i thought was pretty good but by the time they got around to 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 actually taking that outline to script it was ernie doing it and a lot of the wwe stars had uh ha had changed i don't know if that was the licensor or if it was i mean i don't i don't think ernie uh would have been very partisan for one wrestler over the other i i, I know him pretty well he's he's a a good guy we work together on Nico and the sort of sort of light in the same room, and he's uh, he's a really fun, really smart, creative guy. Um, but I had like uh, Dusty Rhodes, I don't who was this uh, uh, older wrestler who would have these long rants about you know about hard times and he was all and his his bit was just uh the the you know you, you you keep doing it and you get through the hard times and stuff and he was fun and some of the other stuff uh you know the the speed demon was there um i don't remember the the dvd well enough to let you know i think I think just the very, very barest bones of the story, the idea that there's a competition cross country um, is what was there. W.W. Qualls was named after my uh, my nephew, William Wayne Qualls. Um, and I, you know, past that, I, I don't remember that outline very well. <laughs> that was... Uh, that's uh that was a year where uh, i did so many things one after the other um and i was uh glad to see that ernie was doing it because i knew it was in good hands 
Yeah, I mean, certainly, like you're saying, with the amount of kind of fresh ideas and things that you have to come up with, like you say, for one episode, you can have three different pitches. It must be so difficult to keep track of everything. And I guess kind of going into writing this, we know that you had a great insight and background with Scooby. But what about the WWE? Is that something that you'd kind of had an interest in? So you had the background of the two and could bring them together quite well? Is it something you needed to kind of do your research on to bring them together or anything? I had two friends when I was younger, Dwayne McDuffie and Robert L. Washington III, who were much more into wrestling than I was. Uh, they, uh, Dwayne would say that the best comic book writing right now is going on in the WWE, um, or actually at the time you might have said the WWF, but... Um, Sounds uh, like you, JV, you call it that. <laughs> WWE. Hmm? That's what JV calls it. He's never like he was never like I guess I guess kind of you saw it more from like watching it through Scooby, right? Yeah. And so you always called it the WWF. Well, you that's, never actually. That's my side of things. I mean, I think like the whole WWE and wrestling is polarizing to a point where it, I don't think it's a stance where you either love it or hate it. But there's a lot of different things going on with the WWE, like storylines yeah. and things like. I think from memory, I will admit there's only maybe about two wrestlers that I can name, and that's. The Undertaker and John Cena. So I'm quite novice when it comes to wrestling. So when it comes to outlining a crossover like this, to what yeah. extent is it a case of let's push the Scooby side of things and let's push like these wrestlers? Well, it's totally going to make sense for both. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got two, uh, I wouldn't say two boardrooms, but you've got like uh, two entities who are trying to do a co-production. They've both got to be happy with it. And of course, Scooby is a very is a property that's very well suited to that. You've got uh, the history of this, the Scooby mystery movies um, where it was guest star after guest star. It, and the anthology nature of Scooby means you can have people run into each other for the first time every, every time anyway. And so it's very easy to introduce guest characters like that. And um, so, uh, you know, definitely uh, the WWE had a lot more um, specific wants out of this than Warner, because Warner is, it has to be a Scooby story that's, uh, that's worth, worth telling, and it has to include these people. And a, Sco a Scooby story that's worth telling is, and no offense to the property, it's not as high a bar as all of these uh, wrestlers and uh, um, Stephanie McMahon and all those people uh, need to uh, see themselves adequately represented in a way, they're, they're real life. They're, they're real world people, you know, and so I think they're going to have a lot more of, well, I would never say that, you know, yeah. or it's like, oh, Fred, Fred's got to put on a dress. Okay. Yes, it's, 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 uh, it's um, by, by its nature, they, they both need to be served, but, uh, but the, the, the real people are going to be pickier, I yeah. guess is. That's the short version of that. <laughs> it kind of makes sense in a way. I mean, you hear so many like weird things to do with wrestlers turned actors, and they've got stuff in their contracts, like they'll only sign up to a movie, it, and but they can't appear to be weak in the movie. They always have to be like on top. So you do kind yeah. of see that whole front kind of at the forefront when it comes to something like this. But then equally to that end, when it came to writing the story, do you think it was easier that it wasn't a WWE wrestling story and it was WWE in like a race car setting? Yes. Um, yeah, I think the first movie had explored a WWE wrestling story. And I, I think that would have felt like just a variation on the first one if we would have done that. And um, dang, I had something that I wanted to stress. Yeah. Well, either it'll come back to me or it won't. Um, oh, just uh, an amazing guy that I know is a guy named Colin Campbell, who wrote for the WWE 
for many years. And I just happened to meet him socially shortly before I did this. And so I did kind of pick his brain for uh, the personalities of the different people. Like, uh, like, did The Undertaker stay in? I'm trying to remember. Yeah, he had like this this monster death truck thing. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, Colin was was great with that. He uh, he's an interesting guy because he he writes for wrestling and he also writes for like Discovery Channel documentaries. He's he's another polymath. Um, but uh, and he's aggressively Scottish, which I think is wonderful. <laughs> uh so i mean it's uh no i don't i don't want to pat myself too much on the back because it ended up that ernie was the one who who got it over the line the out the outline uh has a lot of stuff that didn't happen um but it's uh um I think it did a really good job under the circumstances of having to satisfy all that. I think was was John Cena in it now? John Cena no. was in the first one, not the Speed Demon. Right? Yeah, I think maybe either he had blown up too big for this by then, or I had it, and then he and then Ernie had to write it without him. I Ernie would know, you know, I this is this is a while ago <laughs> oh yeah ernie has a much better memory than i do so i mean yeah scooby's uh uh the the wwe movie was a lot of fun and um you know it's i it's weird that the two real long forms that i've done are that and a hellboy uh direct to video it's uh it seems like licensed characters follow me around. No, I mean, you mentioned like the thing about memory there, and I am impressed though, because when you mention all of these stories, even going back to, you know, what's new Scooby Doo 20 years ago now, it's like when like someone could quiz me about something that I'd done last week and I wouldn't have the faintest <laughs> idea. So it is yeah. absolutely commendable that you do have so many good memories of that. So thank you so much for sharing. And so, I guess that's all of the questions we have down for you about, you know, all the Scooby stuff and what happened before. But I guess now I'll quickly pass on to Millie about any future topics. Yeah, I mean, do you have any upcoming projects at the moment that you can talk about? Yeah, um, I've been writing for uh, a preschool show called Stillwater. I don't know if it, they have it in the UK or not. It's uh, this very, it's preschool, so you might not even care, but... <laughs> It's, it's a, it's the healthiest show I've ever written for. It's all about, uh, real world, uh, ways that kids can, uh, can bring, uh, uh, mindfulness into their lives. It's, it's on Apple TV. It's really fun. Um, I have, uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but I can't imagine they'd get too mad. There's a show that I'm very eager to see called Ianu Child of Wonder that's coming to HBO Max that's uh, by Lion Forge Animation. They're fantastic. I don't know if you know the, the, the Oscar winning short Hair Love was uh, their production. This is their first uh, series, um, well, first half hour series with action and it's just gorgeous. Um, I am not sure that i'm allowed to say that i'm involved with it but uh i'm not the story editor and that's all i'm gonna say <laughs> um, it's uh it's i'm really looking forward to that it's well that's the hard part is like you know everything's covered by an nda until it's on imdb basically um what else uh well hello kitty is pretty much done uh, um oh i i wrote a teen titans go that's probably coming out this year oh wow which is well that was a big thrill for me too because uh um i started with with comedy uh with those seven minute comedies that i told you about um and also this one was featuring the doom patrol 
which uh, that was when I got into comics, it was mostly through back issue bins. And I always thought the Doom Patrol was awesome. And I always thought Howard the Duck was awesome. And now that that I've done the Doom Patrol in a Teen Titans Go episode, and my God, are they fun. um, I also uh, can say that I've written pretty much every popular culture character that I want to, with the exception of Howard the Duck. Well, I think there's some. Well, there's like a lot of series of the new What If show coming out soon. So, like, hopefully at some point there's like a Howard the Duck one on. Like, they can get you yeah. on that. I would love that. Um, that God was that Doc and 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 Burke. Um, do you know who the story editors were on that? On What If. On uh, on What If, yeah. Oh, I don't from memory now. Okay, well, I think it was Kevin Burke and, and Doc Wyatt. If it wasn't, I apologize to whoever it was. But <laughs> um, it's, uh, yeah, that I'm really looking forward to more of that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I, I'm i trying to think of what else I have to plug that I can, and there isn't a heck of a lot. Um I'm just really happy to hear that there's some animation coming to HBO Max. That's such a sigh of relief because there's been kind of some issues about that lately. So it's amazing to hear that there's some good progression oh. going forward. Yeah, they yanked the plug on everything. We were so nervous for so long. But season one is written. I'm not I'm not sure I'm allowed to say any of this. Okay, we, we, we see season one is written. Um there may or may not be a season two, but I sure do spend a lot of time on it. Um, so, <laughs> uh, yeah, and it's uh, HBO Max has um, ha- they they did switch ex- executives on us, and that's when we thought, oh, here here it goes. But then it, that didn't happen. But then, we're, as far as we know, we're still premiering, and um, uh, it it's a wonderful show. It's got more action than I've seen in a cartoon since probably uh, Legend of Korra. Just as far as like, you know, physical uh, sparring and stuff. And it's also got a really, uh, really fun, really, I don't, I don't want to get mystic, a real life affirming uh, story to it. I I just want to say. So that's about that. It sounds amazing. And I guess kind of like you say, there's often, you know, NDA surrounding things, stuff like that. You can't always say what you are working on. I mean, where's the best place for people to kind of keep up to date as and when projects have been announced and you get release dates and things like that? Um, Probably my Facebook page would be the only place that you'd see that anywhere. Um, so, you know, it's it's out there. I'm Matt Wayne on Facebook. I don't know what number comes after my name, but um, the one with all the animation people attached to it. Uh, and uh, IMDB is, you know, usually the day stuff comes out, either I or somebody else goes and quickly puts it up there. I, I believe it's got everything that I've done, including Biker Mice from Mars, which uh, is about as, as obscure as I get, I hope um and so that's that's how you do that well, that's incredible i mean thank you so much for all of your time today that is all the questions that we did have down for you and you've been so generous with your time and your answers so thank you so so much because we really do appreciate that well it's my pleasure it's a pleasure to meet both of you and uh please let me know when it's on Thank you so much. We absolutely will. And I guess for the purpose of wrapping things up in terms of the video, I want to thank everyone watching this because it's absolutely amazing to see the audience build and grow and some regular people that come often like still coming and introducing people to it. So that's absolutely incredible. So if you do want to see more, then please like, comment and subscribe and we'll see you next time.